Hi, my name is Amanda Zeba. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. Today I'm going to be sharing the first chapter of the book, The False Prince with You by Jennifer A. Nielsen, and you are in for a treat, not only because this is a fantastic book, but because after I read you the first chapter, we're going to have a conversation with the author. Let me read you the inside book blurb so that you can know a little bit more what this book is about. Four boys, one treacherous plan, an entire kingdom to fool. In a faraway land, civil war is brewing. To unify his kingdom's divided people, a nobleman named Connor devises a cunning plan to find an impersonator of the king's long-lost son and install him on the throne. Four orphans are forced to compete for the role, including a defiant and clever boy named Sage. Sage knows that Connor's motives are more than questionable, yet his life balances on a sword's point. He must be chosen to play the prince, or he will certainly be killed. His rivals will be devising their own plots as well, so Sage must trust no one and keep his thoughts hidden. As Sage moves from a rundown orphanage to Connor's sumptuous palace, layer upon layer of deceit unfolds until finally a truth is revealed that may very well prove more dangerous than all of the lies together. I remember the first time I read this book, it was aloud to a class of my sixth grade students and every day they begged for just one more chapter. And so I won't keep you waiting any longer. Let's dive right in and read chapter one. If I had to do it all over again, I would not have chosen this life. Then again, I'm not sure I ever had a choice. These were my thoughts as I raced away from the market with a stolen roast tucked under my arm. I'd never attempted roast thievery before, but I was already regretting it. It happens to be very difficult to hold a chunk of raw meat while running, more slippery than I'd anticipated. If the butcher didn't catch me with his cleaver first and literally cut off my future plans, I vowed to remember to get the meat wrapped next to him, then steal it. He was only a few paces behind now, chasing me at a better speed than I'd have expected for a man of his girth. He yelled very loudly in his native language, one I didn't recognize. He was originally from one of the far western countries, undoubtedly a country where killing a meat thief was allowed. It was this sort of thought that encouraged me to run faster. I rounded a corner just as the cleaver suddenly cut into a wood post behind me. Even though he was aiming for me, I couldn't help but admire his throwing accuracy. If I hadn't turned when I did, the cleaver would have found its target. But I was only a block from Mrs. Trebeldi's orphanage for disadvantaged boys. I knew how to disappear there. And I might have made it if not for the bald man sitting outside the tavern who stretched out his foot in time to trip me. Luckily, I managed to keep hold of the roast, although it did no favors to my right shoulder as I fell onto the hard dirt road. The butcher leaned over me and laughed. About time you get what's coming to you, filthy beggar. As a point of fact, I hadn't begged for anything. It was beneath me. His laughter was quickly followed up with a kick to my back that chased my breath away. I curled into a ball, prepared for a beating I wasn't sure I'd live to regret. The butcher landed a second kick, and had reared back for a third when another man shouted, Stop! The butcher turned. You stay out of this. He stole a roast. An entire roast? Really? And what is the cost? Thirty garlands. My well-trained ears heard the sound of coins in a bag. Then the man said, I'll pay you fifty garlands if you turn that boy over to me now. Fifty? One moment. The butcher gave me a final kick in the side and then leaned low toward me. If you ever come into my shop again, I'll cut you up and sell you at the meat market. Got it? The message was straightforward. I nodded. The man paid the butcher who stomped away. I wanted to look up to whoever had saved me of further beating, but I was hunched in the only position that didn't send me gasping in pain, and I was in no hurry to change that. The pity I felt for myself wasn't shared by the man with the coins. He grabbed my shirt and yanked me to my feet. Our eyes locked as he lifted me. His were dark brown and more tightly focused than I'd ever seen before. He smiled slightly as he studied me, his thin mouth barely visible behind a neatly trimmed brown beard. He looked to be somewhat in his forties and dressed in the fine clothes of the upper class, but based on the way he'd lifted me, he was much stronger than I'd expected of a nobleman. I'll have a word with you, boy, he said. You'll walk me to the orphanage or I'll have you carried there. The entire right side of my body throbbed, but the left side was okay, so I favored it as I started to walk. Stand up straight, the man ordered. I ignored him. He was probably some rich country gentleman who wanted to purchase an indentured servant for his lands. Although I was eager to leave behind the tough streets of Karchar, 
servitude wasn't in my future plans, which meant I would walk as crookedly as I wanted. Besides, my right leg really did hurt. At Mrs. Trebeldi's orphanage for disadvantaged boys, it was the only place for an orphan boy in the northern end of Carthia. Nineteen of us lived there, ranging in age from three to fifteen. I was almost fifteen, and any day now Mrs. Trebeldi would send me away. But I didn't want to leave yet, and certainly not as this stranger's servant boy. Mrs. Trebeldi was waiting in her office when I walked in, with a man close behind me. She was too fat to credibly claim she starved along with the rest of us, but strong enough to beat anyone who complained about that fact. In recent months, she and I had settled into a routine of barely tolerating each other. Mrs. Trebeldi must have seen what happened outside because she shook her said head and said, A roast? What were you thinking? We had a lot of hungry boys, I said. You can't feed us bean bread every day and not have a revolt. You'll give me that roast then, she said, holding out her plump hands. Business first. I clutched the roast more tightly to myself and nodded at the man. Who's he? The man stepped forward. My name is Bevan Connor. Tell me yours. I stared at him without answering, which earned me a whack on the back of the head from Mrs. Trebeldi's broom. His name is Sage, she told Connor. And as I told you before, you'd be better off with a rabid badger than this one. Connor raised an eyebrow and stared at me as if that amused him, which was annoying because I had no interest in providing him with any entertainment. So I tossed my hair out of my eyes and said, she's right, so can I go now? Connor frowned and shook his head. The moment of amusement had passed. What can you do, boy? If you'd bothered to ask my name, you might use it. He continued as if he hadn't heard me. Also annoying. What's your training? He don't have any, Mrs. Trebeldi said. None a gentleman like yourself would need anyhow. What did your father do? Connor asked me. He was best as a musician, but still a terrible one, I said. If he made a single coin from playing, my family never saw it. He was probably a drunk, Mrs. Trebeldi wrapped my ear with her knuckles, so this one's made his way through theft and lies. What sort of lies? I wasn't sure if the question was directed to me or Mrs. Trebeldi, but he was looking at Mrs. Trebeldi, so I let her speak. She took Connor by the arm and pulled him into a corner, which was an entirely useless gesture because not only was I standing right there and perfectly able to hear every word, but the story was also about me, so it was hardly a secret. Connor obliged her, though I noticed he faced himself toward me as she spoke. First time the boy came in here, he had a shiny silver coin in his hand. Said he was a runaway, the son of a dead duke from somewhere in Avenia. Only he didn't want to be a duke, so if I took him in and gave him preferential care and a place to hide, he'd pay me a coin a week. Kept it up for two weeks, all the time laughing it up on extra servings and dinner, and extra blankets on his bed. Connor glanced at me and I rolled my eyes. He'd be less impressed when she finished the story. Then one night, he took with a fever. Got all delirious late in the night, hitting at everyone and yelling and such. I was there when he confessed it all. He's no son of anyone important. The coins belonged to a duke all right, but he'd stolen them to trick me into caring for him. I dumped his body into the cellar to get better or not. I didn't care. Next I checked on him. He'd gotten over the fever on his own, and he was a good deal more humble. Connor looked at me again. He doesn't look so humble now. I got over that too, I said. So why'd you let him stay? Connor asked Mrs. Trebeldi. Mrs. Trebeldi hesitated. She didn't want to tell him it was because I picked up goodies for her now and then. Ribbon for her hats or chocolates from the cake shop. Because of that, Mrs. Trebeldi didn't hate me nearly as much as she pretended to. Or maybe she did. I stole from her too. Connor walked back to me. A thief and a liar, eh? Can you manage a sword? Sure, if my opponent doesn't have one. He grinned. Do you farm? <laughs> no. I took that as an insult. Hunt? No. Can you read? I stared up at him through the parts of my hair. What are you wanting me for, Connor? You'll address me as Sir or Master Connor. What are you wanting me for, Sir Master Connor? That's a conversation for another time. Gather your things. I'll wait for you here. I shook my head. Sorry, but when I leave the comfort of Mrs. Trebeldi's fine establishment, I will go on my own. You're going with him, Mrs. Trebeldi said. You've been bought and paid for by Master Connor, and I can't wait to be rid of you. You'll earn your freedom by doing whatever I ask of you and by doing it well, Connor added, or serve me poorly and serve me for life. I wouldn't serve anyone for an hour until freedom, I said. Connor took a step toward me, hands out. I threw the roast I'd been holding at him, and he flinched to avoid it. 
Using that moment, I pushed past Mrs. Trebeldi and darted into the street. It would have been helpful to know that he'd left a couple of vigils at the door. One grabbed my arms while he clubbed... One grabbed my arms while the other clubbed me over the head from behind. I barely had time to curse their mother's graves before I crumpled to the ground. So if you uh, are wanting to see what happens next to Sage in the story of the False Prince, you can pick up a copy and get reading. Right now, I'd love to introduce you to the author herself, where we have a conversation about this story, her writing process, and lots of other goodies. All right, readers, we are here today with author Jennifer A. Nielsen to talk about her book, uh, The False Prince. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. It's uh, really an honor to have this time with you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, so the first question I have for you is what was the story seedling for this book about Sage? Where did um, your idea come from? <laughs> All right, this is, uh, this is just... I've, I've tried to think like, okay, where is the absolute first moment? And I think I've got it. Um, so when I was working on the book at the time, my daughter was young and she loved these Barbie movies. Yeah. And, and they were just, they're just awful. Like they were just painful for me just, you know, day after day of these Barbie movies, but she loved them. Well, there was one movie I just kind of hated less than the others, which was The Princess and Popper. I know uh, what movie you're talking about. I know yes. that. One. Okay. That one, I mean, if, if I'm even being honest, I, I mean, it was sappy, but I kind of liked the music. Yeah. And so if she had to do a Barbie movie, I would just be like Princess and the Popper. Like I just pushed that one because I could tolerate it. And I think something about that stuck in my head where you have these two, you know, girls, Barbies who have to switch places and one of them becoming a royal. And I think that is where I started to think about if you're forced to become, you know, to impersonate a royal. And, and so I twisted the idea that, you know, it certainly wasn't voluntary, but I think, I really think the genesis of the idea for False Prince is a Barbie DVD. <laughs> That's incredible. I love that. I love how real life, you know, filters its way in. That's awesome. Well, and I think it should, you know, that that's, that's, you, we all draw from whatever happens around us. And so it's just about being aware of that. So yeah, Barbie. Yeah, that's a really good point is that like paying attention to what's happening around us and the way we feel about those things. Um, I think sometimes, especially people who are newer to writing feel like they have to have like a fantastic life to be able to write fantastical stories, but it's just paying attention to the little things. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's that, you know, it's, it's as soon as something grabs my attention, then I start asking questions because the questions become story. But, but when you learn to ask those questions and then you trust your imagination, uh, you'll never run out of ideas, ever. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, my next question is a bit about your writing process. So in the writing world, we say there's kind of two camps, the plotters, the people who plan out everything that's going to happen, and the pantsers, the people who fly by the seat of their pants and just write what comes to them. Um, which would you say you are, and if you could tell us a little bit about how you write your books? Yeah, um, I am a plotter. And, um, and for me, it's, and, and I get like, I mean, whatever method gets you to type the words the end, that's the right method for you, right? For me, though, uh, because I do like kind of surprise endings, I do like to, you know, put in little oh, aha moments uh, for my readers, I've got to set those up. You can't just put in a surprise without having laid a foundation for it. Otherwise, it's a bit of a cheat. And, and so I wouldn't know to, you know, lay that foundation if I didn't know where I was heading. And so to me, it's like if you were planning a vacation, you have to know where you're going. Like, mm -hmm. otherwise, how do you know which way to drive your car down the road? And so I, uh, I always plan it out and nothing's in stone. I always get surprised myself and new ideas will come and stuff. But I, I find if I do a really good job planning in advance, it's just fewer rewrites and it's, um, and it's just a cleaner process if I spend that time in the beginning. But, um, but again, it always changes and yep. And I'm open to that because as we get to know our characters better, they'll, they'll tell us things about their story. 
Yeah, and that's an excellent segue for my next question, which is um, Sage is the main character in this book. And while he is sometimes brutally honest, um, I also sometimes get the feeling that he isn't telling me the whole truth. Uh, and I don't want to give any spoilers, but um, did he complicate your writing process for you just because of his personality? <laughs> Uh, so this is this is the part. Whenever I talk about Sage, I just have to confess he lives in my imagination, and he is just there as a narrator far more often than he ought to be. Um, and and so yeah, absolutely, he was a complication, but I'm glad he was because um, he would insert himself into my plans with like, nope, that's not the way it's going to happen. Um, for those of your readers who um, have read. The story, the scene with the rock, um, when when the rock goes missing, I had an entirely different plan for how that was going to go, and uh, part of it involved him giving up the rock, and and for those who don't know the story, it's just a stupid rock. Like you could go outside and pick one up right now. It's just a stupid rock, and my plan is like it's just a stupid rock, and he's like, no, it's not, and I'm not going along with that, and so it would require just a conversation in my imagination to figure out why is this such a big deal to him. Um, but regarding, you know, the, the unreliable narrator that he is, in his perspective, he is square with um, exactly the truth all the time, but he has, he has no problem with anybody who misunderstands him. Yeah, so good. I love, I love his complexity. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is the map in the front of the book. And I'll, I'll maybe enter a screenshot of this when I do the video, but I'll just show readers real quick right here. There's a map in the front of the book. And I love when books have maps. I just feel like this is another like layer to the story to help me better understand. I feel like they're so beautiful. Um, and so I'm curious, uh, did you design that map? Did you, I know that sometimes when books are put together, uh, there are things that authors get to have a say about and things that authors don't get to have a say about. Um, do you like hand draw these maps while you're doing your writing process? Just if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I created the map. I am, um, my art skills are roughly, uh, first grade minus, I mean, it's, I don't, I'm not an artist, so I actually had to apologize um, when I sent the map drawing to my editor for the artist to do. So all of the beauty of the map, that is somebody else's work, but the layout is mine. And, and I believe strongly in maps. I use them for nearly everything I write because it defines the world and the space. And, and it defines, you know, how long will it take to travel from here to here and, and what hazards are in the way? Um, are, are they going to have access to water? Um, I'm gonna just angle my screen a little. I'm working on a World War I story right now. You can see the map right here. Um, that's a, a, the world like of Europe in 1914. Mm -hmm. So I'm always using maps. And um, so even if it doesn't appear in the book, I had one. Awesome. That's so great. It's good to know like the different tools that people use as, as they're doing that. And especially since this is a made up world, um, you know, you had to create this as opposed to using um, something that's already out there. So that's interesting to me too, that like your creativity bends beyond words uh, in your process. Well, I think, I think um, the visuals are, are just highly valuable in, in whatever way you can find them. I mean, far than wood, uh, I based on a real place. Um, and uh, a lot of images that I would pull in is, is almost like a, a visual scrapbook. Um, and I use all of that, but um, maps in particular, um, it, it, it helps so much, especially in series writing, because I might not know, you know, details of the plot in book three, but now that I formed this map, the map helps me create the plot because now I can say, oh, I've got this very narrow mountain pass to the north. How can I use that? And so I, it helps in the writing because I'm never at a blank slate. Uh, this question wasn't on my list, but it, it's too good not to ask after you just said that. So this book is the first in a series of four. And so when you started out, did you know that it was going to be a series? Did you know there were going to be four books? You said you're a plotter, like how far ahead do you plot? 
Uh, I knew about halfway through uh, book one that the world I had built was bigger than a single book. And I knew that there would be consequences for what happens in book one. So about halfway through, I started to think about, okay, what will those consequences be? How are the characters going to react to them? And so that led to a trilogy uh, sort of design. And then a couple of uh, years ago, Sage was back in my head again. And he was, he was there in my imagination and he was like, I am so bored. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really? I said, you feel like getting in trouble? He's like, absolutely. And so that's when I started working on book four. And then book five, Shattered Castle, comes out this fall. And uh, so that, yeah, and so that's the consequences of him just uh, complaining. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Well, sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Uh, well, and he is um, always the squeakiest wheel in the room. I mean, by design, he's the loudest whiner of all. Yeah, well, you know, yay for him because he gets more time on the page. <laughs> he's fine with that. Yes. All right, I got to look. I can't remember my last question. Um, okay, there are a lot of students and teachers who are listening to our conversation right now, which is great. Um, and in preparation for this interview, I went to your website and did some digging around and there are so many amazing things there um, for teachers, for writers, for students, for readers. So if you could just give us a quick overview of what they can um, expect to find there and maybe help them along on their own journey. Yeah, um, for uh, readers, just, uh, I mean, so my website is jennielsen.com. Uh, you know, if you just Google my name, it should be the top hit that comes up. But uh, I mean, you can always follow my blog for just the most updated um, version of what's ever happening. And I do a lot of giveaways there. So for, for readers, absolutely check in on my blog because I, I do, I give away tons. Um, for writers, there is a link that is just for writers and it's just writer's tips, which was things like notes I made for myself as I was really trying to improve my own writing skills. So it's actually a very personal list for me. It's the everything that's on that list is there because I needed it. And so if you study the list, you'll see a lot of the journey I took in uh, going from a beginner writer to a published writer. And then for teachers, especially once uh, COVID hit and so many teachers were looking for resources from home, um, there are, there's information about most of my books and first chapter readings and extra activities that you can do. And then I just very recently added um, some links to some YouTube videos which are just some chats I did about specific writing skills. So as a teacher, you can pull that up and say, all right, here's an author talking about research process or about first drafts or about how I do rewrites. And uh, that's just answering questions um, from fans um, on writing skills. So yes, please check it out. There is, um, that information is there for readers and writers and teachers, and I hope you'll use it. Awesome. Well, I know I'm going to go check out those YouTube videos. Uh, I'll put them at the top of my watch list. So um, what's next for you? Uh, you, you mentioned a, a new release this fall. What other things are you working on or can we look forward to reading soon? Yeah. So I am, I am somebody, I tend to have a lot going on at um, the same time. And so I have this fall, I'll show you a picture. I don't have an arc yet, but this is the cover for book five. A Shattered Castle. Oh, that looks so great. Kind of beautiful. Uh, very excited about this. I'm working on, I showed you the map, I'm working on a World War I novel called Lines of Courage, which uh, will be out next spring. And then um, my writing, I am right now doing a very, very strange book called Black Ink. And uh, Black Ink is about this, uh, it's contemporary. It's about this boy who's hiding from some very bad people, but he doesn't know why he's hiding because he actually has no memory but uh, that's okay because he has a sharpie and uh, if he writes on his forearm if what he writes is true about himself it stays on the surface of the skin if it's not true it soaks in and every day he writes down a different name and every day it soaks in so he doesn't even yet know his own name but on the weekend he volunteers at the old folks home because if uh, he plays games with the old folks they feed him he loves to play boggle with them. 
All right. So this is a dice game. You shake up the dice, they fall in a tray, and then you try to find words in the tray. Well, one day this boy shakes up the dice. And when the words, um, when the dice land, he reads out, they know you are here, go. Oh, I just got you. Oh. I know. So I'm doing this very weird story about this boy with no memory, but he's got a magic Sharpie and a boggle set that sometimes communicates to him. So that's, that's where my uh, mind is at right now. Oh my gosh. It sounds, it sounds incredible. Well, and like probably really cool to be able to bounce from one to the other. So if you get, you know, too bogged down in, in scary, sad things with World War I, you can switch over to this other world. And if you need to think about that, you can, I, I, I personally like having multiple projects going as well. You're the same way. Yeah, I think creatively it, it keeps everything fresh and because uh, there's always somewhere else you can jump to. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and thoughts with us today. I know everyone's excited to uh, head to their local bookstore or library and find your books so that they can give them a read for yourself. But uh, have a good rest of your week and a good rest of your 2021. Thank you so much. Thank you for hosting me. And thanks to everyone who's watching. I appreciate it. Have a great day.